thank you for the scintillating introduction. Uh, as this gentleman said, uh, my name is David. Uh, I work at MongoDB. MongoDB uh, loves Go. We have a lot of major projects built in Go, a lot of infrastructure built in Go. We like to hire people in Go, including from my team. So come find me afterwards or email me. I'm David at MongoDB.com if you're interested. <laughs> this talk is about garbage. <laughs> And by garbage, since we're programmers, we're talking about discarded memory. Some object that you had that was really useful, you got it off the heap, and then when you're done with it, what do we do? We just kind of drop it on the ground or on the stage. And some programs do this a lot, and they produce a lot of objects that get created and discarded. Now, Go uh, provides in the runtime a garbage collector. So the garbage collector has a job to sweep up all these things and, and make them used for us again. But the problem is that some programs produce a lot of garbage, so much garbage that the garbage collector gets really, really busy just hauling around all of this trash. And so does this really matter to us as programmers? And as you can imagine, the answer is going to be yes. Um, this is a profiling tool called a flame graph. And uh, this is for a program that I'm going to talk about a little bit later on. And I'm going to give you like the 30 second introduction to uh, flame graphs so you can follow along. So every box represents a function call uh, that the profiler collected. The call stack grows down. Uh, and the width of a box is the execution time sort of summarized across all the different profile uh, snapshots that were taken. So the full width of the, of the graph is the whole program. And based on the width, you can kind of tell how much of the program's time was spent in the execution of some particular function. Um, the left to right order is completely meaningless. It's just an artifact of how the, uh, the uh, statistics were summarized. And what I want to talk about here is the execution time of this piece. Uh, and I'll zoom in. And this is uh, a function called run bench. This is the code that I actually wrote that I called in the main function after turning on the profiler. So this is the work that I was asking the program to do. Everything else outside that box is something that the runtime is doing for us that is helpful, but certainly I didn't ask for. It's stuff other stuff that's going on. In this case, it's garbage collection. Here is another flame graph of the exact same work, the exact same run bench function, but with a different memory management strategy. So again, don't worry about left to right. The box moved over. But notice that the width of the box got a little bit bigger. Here's another example. Exact same work, different memory management strategy. And now you can see that the box is taking up most of them. So most of the program is actually what I want, and not very much of it is um, being sucked away by the runtime. So what's going on here? Uh, and what does this have to do with slices, which was part of the talk? Now, um, there's some gross simplifications ahead. Don't find me afterwards and tell me how wrong it is, because I know it's wrong. This is simplified for a large group in a short time. First key point, the garbage collector runs when your live heat memory doubles. So when you consume a lot more memory, that's a trigger that the garbage collector needs to do its job and see if any of that can be reclaimed. And the other important point is that the garbage collector will steal time if it can't keep up. So if you are allocating so fast that the garbage collector, as it's sweeping, just is never going to get to the end of stuff you're allocating, it would never finish its job. So what the garbage collector does is it steals time back from your program to finish hunting through the memory. So you will get this sort of back pressure happening from the garbage collector. So what do we want to do? We want to allocate less. And how do we allocate less? Well, we'll recycle, right? Rather than throwing things around the stage, or, or dropping them, we will put them into a nice box where we can collect them and use them later. And the Go core library provides a nice type for this called a sync pool. We have some good syncing down jokes earlier today. Sync pool is really useful. It recycles objects between garbage collection cycles. So when the garbage collector runs, the sync pool gets tossed out. It's a cache. But in between, you have all these objects there that you can reuse them when you need them. But they're not designed for slices. Uh, and this has some interesting kind of effects if you sort of think about it. Um, and what do I mean by this? Well, one big thing is that it's not size aware, right? A slice could be very big, it could be very small. You have these containers with very, very different sizes, and the pool doesn't know anything about the size of the things inside it. Um, and so because these capacities in the pool will differ, um, it's not really clear what you're going to get out from based on what you put in. Pool order is undefined, right? When you, the actual sort of documentation says, don't assume that you get out the thing you put in or in any particular order. There's under the covers, there's caches per CPU and all this stuff going on. So when you put a container of a certain size in, you don't know that that's the next thing you're getting out. You're going to get out something else, perhaps. And that leads to circumstances like this. So let's imagine I have a little bit of water and I need a container for it. Oops. The pool gave me a giant container. I don't need all of this space, but it handed it to me because that was the thing that was there. Or we could have the opposite problem, where I have a lot of water, 
but oops, I only got a tiny container for it. It wasn't really very helpful. Which leads to an interesting thought about what do we do when we have a container and we want to put stuff in and it doesn't fit, right? Well, this is like a pen, right? So if we think about a pen, hopefully most people, if you've done some Go programming, have seen this idiom. I have some x's, I want to append some y's, and so I say x's equals append of the x's and the y's. And what I'm, we know is that the x's might not be the same before and after, right? And what's happening is that if I have some x's and I need to add some y's and the, I, my container for x's isn't big enough, well, the runtime will do something very helpful. It'll allocate a bigger slice. It'll pour all the water over from the x's, and it'll add the rest of it from the y's, and it'll give it back to me. But what that means is that the old one is thrown away. right? And so if you're thinking about trying to use a sync pool, but you're also using a pen, you're going to have this problem. Most of the time, you're going to get stuff back into your container, but sometimes it's just going to get lost on the floor. So what can we do about this? And in order to sort of illustrate some things, I want us to consider a, a very trivial encoder. Um, one of my coworkers said, you should talk about encoders and why, why you care. Um, so why do I care about encoders? Uh, because I work at MongoDB, MongoDB has a job of taking user data and passing it up to the database. And we use a format called BSON, which is kind of like binary JSON, except it's not really binary JSON, but it's binary. And so we do a lot of marshaling and unmarshaling, a lot of encoding, and so we start to care a lot about performance. But for today's encoder, I'm going to make it really simple. We're going to have string keys and integer values. And we'll pack them into something that's about as uh, naive as I could think of. A nice packed binary format of C strings, so null terminated strings, and some bytes for an integer repeated by another, and another, and another, and so on and so forth. And what this is useful for uh, is it gives us variable length again. right? So depending on how many keys or the length of the keys, we, I might need a very big container. I might need a very small container. And then to experiment with different memory management strategies, I want pluggable memory management. And so we use an interface something like this. Uh, I have a byte pool as an interface where I have a get and a put. So get pulls something out of this pool. Put sort of recycles it back in. And then we have a resize. And resize is kind of to simulate, with, under controlled circumstances, what a pen does, which is to take some original thing, make it bigger, so that I can copy stuff in and move on. Um, and we'd use it something like this. We have some sort of encoder built around the pool. Um, and a buffer that gets allocated from the pool or resized over time as we need. So the encoder uses the pool for all of its allocations, doesn't, doesn't call make directly, and it goes through the abstraction, uses the pool for resizing, never calls a pen, so we're not leaking stuff on the floor. And then when it's done, it releases the buffer back to the pool. We have a bunch of this going on at the same time. We have a bunch of things competing for allocations. So what I'm going to show now is four different strategies for managing memory. Um, the first strategy is what I call the null strategy. We're going to actually use the garbage collector, but intermediated through this abstraction. Sync, where we'll use a sync pool. Power of two, where we'll, we will use multiple sync pools, one per size bucket. So we'll try to sort of make a more size aware structure. And the last is reserved. We're just going to keep a number of buffers around forever for the life of the program and, and try to never give anything back to the garbage collector at all. So the null strategy. The null strategy is built around the garbage collector. We're going to generate garbage and let the uh, runtime deal with it. So we'll start off with a type, which is just an empty struct because we don't really need it, to, need it to do anything. When we call get, we will then call make inside our abstraction to just get a slice of it, a starting capacity. Put does absolutely nothing, so things will just get dropped on the floor when we, when we try to recycle that way. And resize now is where we sort of simulate kind of the append behavior. So we start off by checking if our, the size of our slice, uh, our tar sorry, if our target size is less than the capacity of our original, we can just resize and pass it on back and we're done. But if not, then we need something new. So we, um, in this case, make a completely new slice and we ramp up the capacity, either double the maximum of the twice the original capacity or the size. So if we just need a little bit more than the old capacity, we'll go ahead and double and create some headroom. And if we really need a lot more, then we'll just kind of do that to try not to overallocate. You could do this a number of ways. This is just sort of one way to kind of grow a little more aggressively, aggressively than you're being asked for. right? And then we copy the old uh, original data into our temporary. We return it. And original gets dropped on the floor. So the second strategy is sync. And here we're going to use a sync pool. This time I'm not going to throw it on the stage. So a sync pool um, will have a struct. It wraps around a sync pool. Um, get is going to work like this. So we first try to get 
an object from the sync pool. Now, the sync pool lets you create uh, objects on get. With, I'm not gonna, we're not going to use that. I'm going to use sort of a more simple uh, approach. So when we call get, we're either going to get something from the pool or we're going to get nil if the pool is empty. And it returns empty interface. Now, if we get nil, there was nothing in the pool. So now we have to go and allocate a slice like we did before with our starting capacity, and we return it. If it's not nil, then we got something from the pool. So we have to cast it to bytes. But now we just got something out of a pool. And if we think about recycling again, maybe there was something already in it. And we kind of need to clean it out before we use it. So we iterate over all the bytes and we set them to zero because we want to start off with something that's clean and not dirty. Now, this might seem like horribly inefficient. Oh my god, we're going to go through and set every byte to zero. But we get help. Um, this is actually optimized away by the compiler. The compiler recognizes this idiom and just turns it into a, a mem clear operation, which is pretty efficient. Um, put then just takes this whatever uh, our, our buffer and throws it back into the pool. Resize then actually works very much like the resize for the null strategy with one change. When we make a copy of a new slice, rather than dropping the original, we put the original back into the pool. So now we're not we're doing a resize, but we're not leaking. Power of two strategy works very much like sync pool, but now we have a sync pool per size bucket. Power of two sizing, we can kind of get exactly the size that we want. Um, so rather than having one sync pool, we would have an array of sync pools or slice of sync pools, so we can have them for different size categories. Um, and I'm just going to skip over the details because we don't have a lot of time. I, I'll share later uh, a link to a repository. You can see all of the code yourself. The important thing to know is that the pools are organized by power of two capacities, so we kind of double our size categories each time. Get and resize now call a size aware get n function where you can go and get something out of a pool of an appropriate size or get a, a slice at a starting capacity that it's an appropriate size. And put is also size aware just to sort of stick it back into the right bin when we're done. So the fourth strategy is reserved. Now reserved wants to just keep big containers around. Rather than it being disposal, we're going to grab these things and we're going to hold on to them and we're never going to let them go. And here's one way you could do it. So here we'd have a reserve pool. Now we need to have a mutex. Sync pool handles the concurrency issues for us. But if we're going to be managing that, we need a mutex to control concurrent access. We'd have a pool. Uh, in this case, I'm storing 20 byte slices for reuse. And I'm, 20 is completely arbitrary. And it's because it's the number of Go routines I'm using. You can tune this in sizes for your own purposes. A size so we know how many things are in the pool. And a tar target capacity. And I'll talk about that in a sec. And again, I'm going to skip over all the details rather than trying to show slide after slide of code. Important details are that it works like a capped LIFO stack, last in, first out, last thing we put in, first thing we get out. Resizing grows the target capacity. Whenever the pool sees that you want something larger than you ever had before, it ramps up the target capacity so that all future allocations will be at that size, because we're trying to have lots of big things we keep around. And the consequence of that is that put will drop smaller slices when they're put back in. If you put back in a smaller slice, it says, oh, you know what, we're, we're really aiming for a larger size, we'll get rid of that. But if the idea is you quickly ramp up to some large size and then you keep them. So those are the four strategies, null, sync, power to, and reserved. How can we analyze the performance of these? Um, I'm going to show four ways. And be trying to fit four ways into the remaining time, it's going to be really quick. But I want to give you a sense that there's a lot of ways to look at this problem. Four ways are benchmarking, a maximum heap analysis, profiling with flame graphs. We saw that before, but I'll show you a little more how, we, how I do it, and using a trace browser. Now, we need a workload for this to be able to exercise our encoder. So we're going to encode some large number of items. We'll use 20 go routines. So these 20 go routines will be sort of fighting over allocations from the pool. So it's kind of a, there's some contention there. Have up to 1,000 keys per encoding, up to 200 characters per key. So that's going to give us kind of a range of, of sizes. Um, it did occur to me the other day that this is all sort of uniform distribution, which isn't quite a real world distribution. But it's enough, I think, to illustrate the point. The other thing that I want to do that I think is really important is isolation. So we're going to pre-generate random data outside of our loops. Uh, and then I'm going to turn on the profiler after all the data is generated. Um, and that's really important to sort of keep the data generation parts away from the profiling data. We use a constant random seed so this is kind of repeatable. Um, and the Go routines will iterate their data from a random starting point. So once I've generated a really long list of random data, every Go routine can just kind of pick a random starting point and then just iterate and wrap around. And that lets the Go routines experience random data with very, very low overhead. So all of what I'm seeing in the profiling 
is the work that I want and not random data generation or anything like that. And similarly, the profile and the trace data will be generated with standalone executables, not through go test, because I want to sort of have those, again, independent of the, the code of the test harness and the, and the rest of it. Um, all the code for this is in this repository. I'll show this again at the end. Um, so I'll be talking more about how we use these tools rather than how we do these, do these things. So the first is benchmarking. Um, benchmarking, we run go test dash bench dot and then a package name where it's the directory that you're in. And if we look at these four strategies, we'll see a result something like this. Not surprisingly, the null strategy is the worst, um, takes the longest per operation. Reserved is the best and there's kind of a range between them. It's about roughly or, you know, order of magnitude between the top and the bottom. But you'll notice that all of the memory management strategies other than null are kind of close, you know, order, you know, maybe factor of two-ish between them. So kind of any memory management strategy is better than none. And then I wanted to find out, well, what, how much, what's the maximum heat being used by these different strategies? This turned out to be an interesting problem because I couldn't find it sort of an obvious way to have any existing tool spit it out. Uh, there's like, like click through some graphs and try to read them and find the maximum one. So I fell back on something much more sort of low level but effective. The go debug environment variable can turn on garbage collector tracing like this. And then you wind up with a debug line per garbage collector run. And in the middle of that line will be something like this. And it turns out that this is the number that I want. This is the maximum heap size at the end of the garbage collection run. So if I can kind of take that, parse out the numbers in the middle, run it through sort minus RN, and, and voila, I can find the maximum. So for those four strategies, it looks like this. The null strategy, again, uses a massive amount of memory. And it kind of declines until you get to the reserve strategy, where we said we're going to keep lots of memory on forever, and that's fine. Um, so that's sort of a way of finding out what your maximum heap size is during your run. So then let's talk about profiling. Profiling. Um, I set this up from the executable using a couple of flags. Uh, and you can see this in the repository if you want to look at the details later. But I can set the pool type with a flag. And I can set what kind of profiling I want, in this case, CPU profiling. And then I just sort of pass that to the go tool pprof, telling it I want a local web, uh, local web server to, to see the results in, passing it the executable and the profile data. And it pops up my web browser with something that looks kind of like this. And the interesting thing I want is in the view menu, there's a thing that says flame graph. Click into that, and then we get back to the nice graph that I showed at the beginning of the talk. So you may not be surprised that this was the null strategy. This was the sync strategy, a little bit better. This was the power two strategy. And then the reserve strategy kind of does what we expect, which is really pretty much the whole time of the program is doing the work that I wanted, and very, very little is occupied by anything that the runtime is adding. So that's profiling. Next, we move on to tracing. Tracing, because of the way I've set up the executable, works pretty much the same way. I pass it a pool type, and now I say that the profile type I want is trace. And that produces different output. And then I can call go tool trace, pretty much the same way with the trace output. And it pops up a web browser that looks a little bit like this. And the, one, the thing I want to choose is sort of the top one of viewing the trace. And you'll get a screen like this. And this is enormously complicated screen, and I'm not going to talk through all the details of it. But you should know that you can type question mark for navigation help. And it'll give you hints for how to sort of work through it and navigate it. And one of the interesting things you can do is you can hold down the W key and you kind of zoom in on the graph. And that would look something like this. So this would be the graph zoom in to like tens of milliseconds across the top. Don't know if you can see that in the back, but it's sort of tens of milliseconds, I think. And the interesting line to pay attention to is this one. This is the garbage collection line. So wherever you see sort of blue on this line, is a place where the garbage collector is running. And you can see with the null strategy, it's running most of the time. Um, the other interesting thing to note is below it, there's sort of, a uh, sort of a set of lines for each processor where sort of different Go routines are running. And the bottom parts of those is actually where the runtime is stealing works. So the top part in each of those is kind of a real work of your program. And then anything below that for each processor is work stealing that's happening. You get a kind of a sense of that. So if I zoom back out, uh, we can see the um, null strategy. You see that garbage collection line is pretty much blue all the way across. But as we work through the strategies, you'll see that change. So the sync strategy gets a little bit more sparse. There's periods where the garbage collector didn't need to run. For whatever reason, the random data wasn't as big, and so the garbage collector had a little bit of a break. When we, when we go to the power of two strategy, it's really sparse. Now the garbage collector is really only having to run periodically throughout. 
Um, and the reserve strategy takes that to the extreme where it really only runs a couple times during the program. And you can sort of see visually changes in garbage collector behavior based on trace data. So that's four different ways to look at it, benchmarking, maximum heat, profiling, and trace browser. But I thought it would be interesting to talk about the naive approach for a little bit. So the naive approach is the leaky sync pool, right? I'm going to have a sync pool, but I'm going to call append, and I'm not going to be putting things back in. It's just going to, it's just going to kind of leak out. And we can simulate that by making a leaky sync pool that just deletes this line from what sync pool is doing, just not putting something back in. So we're using a sync pool, but our resizes are, are, uh, are leaky. And so here's what it looks like. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? That actually works really well. So what's going on? And there's a way to visualize it. Imagine we start off with a pool with a variety of container sizes. We get a container out of the pool. We go to put something in. We say, uh-oh, we need to append. We've got to resize it. And that old container gets leaked, but the new larger container gets put back in. Maybe that happens again. That container gets taken out. Turns out that's not big enough. It gets leaked, and a new larger container gets put back in. And every time this happens, a small container gets replaced by a larger container. Well, that looks a lot like the reserve strata, doesn't it? And so the insight there is that leaky behavior in a sync pool actually converges over time on large containers. And if that's really good, that raises another question. Why don't we just start with larger containers in the first place? And so I thought I would sort of give a little demonstration of that too. So in all the, of the examples I showed so far, the starting capacity that I mentioned was just 256 bytes. So that's enough for one really big key, maybe a few small keys. But what if we increase that by a factor of 1,000? Right? So big enough really to cover probably anything we're going to be putting into this. Well, here's the old benchmarks. But with a factor of 1,000 increase in the starting capacity, here's the new benchmarks. Null even gets a little bit better. But pretty much after that, any memory management strategy you choose pretty much is going to be within like the, the, the error bounds of the measurement. If I ran this different times, the numbers would all sort of move around, and, and it wouldn't really matter so much. So, some takeaways from, from all of this that I'd, like, that I'd like you to have. First, don't optimize early. Well, all of these examples are like a super tight loop doing nothing but allocation. These problems may not be the bottlenecks in your programs. Actually, please use the tools I've mentioned to discover if they're your bottlenecks before you try to optimize it. Second, don't get clever. Um, it turns out that the naive sync pool with a pe leaky appends actually works really, really well, and that's great. And we don't need all of the complexity of memory abstractions and calling resize. We could just do the thing that comes naturally, and it actually works really well. You can trade um, space for speed. Reserved actually is a little bit faster because it uses more memory and it doesn't ever have to um, put pressure on the garbage collector or do allocations. So you can make those trade-offs. What really hurts is the resizing. Resizing hurts, and so you want to avoid having to resize containers that are too small. And so that means you should be allocating for the 99th percentile. Not the typical case. Allocate for your maximum case to avoid resizings. And so with that advice, I will wish you all happy recycling. Thank you very much.